Well, we've just arrived at Fort Ticonderoga. Up here by Lake Champlain. Getting ready to head on in. This is the map of Ticonderoga. We are right here. Three and a four. So we're a French two quarter. So if we turn around and look at these mounds behind us, which are these grassy areas. Follow the road down through here, I guess down this way to the fort. Okay, if we're here and we follow this road, five is blue. It's the Royal Ru Roussillon, Guin, Biern, and the Iranian French troops were there. It was 1758 when this all took place. In the mid-18th century, this battlefield was a focal point. In the Seven Years' War, war a world war between France and Great Britain, here the two superpowers struggled for control of Lake Champlain and Lake George Water Highway, the strategic communication link between New York the British Administrative Center in Montreal, the second largest city of New France. In July of 1758, the British, commanded by General James Abercrombie, marched an attack on Fort Carillon, which is Ticonderoga, the newest French fort in New France. The British mustered an army of 16,000 British regulars and American provincials, the largest ever assembled to date in North America. Louis Joseph de Gozon, the Marquis de Montcalm, led the French defense of Carrion. In less than 48 hours, Montcalm's 3,400 French regulars and a handful of Canadians constructed defensive earthworks, the French lines, across the heights of Carrion. In a bloody day of fighting on July 8, 1758, the British lost nearly 2,000 troops. The Highland Regiment suffered nearly two-thirds casualties, the highest sustained by a unit in a single-day action in North American history. Proportionately, Montcalm lost as many. Here, Montcalm had won the greatest French victory of the Seven Years' War, although he was outnumbered five to one. He gave thanks to God by erecting a red-painted cross at the center of the lines. Karen, positioned at the near edge of the killing zone, commemorates the valor of the Highland Regiment. For two generations and two wars, armories returned to the same battlefield. In 1759, the British returned in another attempt to drive the French from Carillon and used the French lines to protect themselves as they lay siege to the fort. During the Revolutionary War, 
the American army dug in here in the summer and fall of 1776 as they succeeded in stopping Sir Guy Carleton's British advance up Lake Champlain. In 1777, the old French earthworks served as the American outer defenses against Burgoyne's advance. Later that autumn, the Americans, under Colonel John Brown, succeeded in recapturing the French lines but lacked sufficient artillery to dislodge the British and German troops garrisoning the fort. Many of these men on many of these men on both sides had fought on the same ground almost 20 years earlier. The little display they got were right outside the actual fort port, the tents. This is the road. I don't know what they're doing over there. This is the men's room at Fort Tyson. Even got a cool view here. We're at the whole lodge part. You know, the admission office. That's, that's where Lake Champlain comes together. Well, and what do we happen to see here? That looks like Woody enjoying the view. <laughs> Keep on looking out for the bad guys. Well, we're at the fort right now, Fort Ticonderoga. We are here. Lake George goes up that way. Lake Champlain is what you see right here. Really neat, beautiful country. Shows the actual fort itself. work here.
Yes, that beat a little hole where the fuse go. Looks like F E C I T Feckit. Feckit eh? seventeen oh two. I like saying feck at all. That's something D E S T Humbert. You stand here and look at this, and you can almost imagine sailing ships out there shooting in here. And these big old cannons. Well, we actually have the land bell here, too. Go up on the upper deck here. Ten bucks a piece to get into this place, though. But it was neat. Zoom in on here. Place up here. Yeah. What time was it? Do you remember? Huh? You remember what time it was? Musket demonstrations at 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 3.
right behind the first section mark. Thank you. Thank you.
muzzle-loading flintlock musket. Smooth bore meaning that the bore of the rifle is smooth, there's no rifling in it. So its accuracy is fairly limited. If I was to aim at something over at the base of the large American flag there, if I was to hit it, it wasn't marksmanship, it was luck. Uh, anything beyond about 50 yards, you're not aiming at a thing, you're aiming at a bunch of things. And basically, if you point it in that direction, you might hit something. Which is why the tactics of the 18th century, at least in Europe, are ranks of men firing at ranks of men. The more men you have firing at a given target, the more likely somebody is to hit something. So you had to get fairly close in order to have any success in hitting anything. There were rifles available in the, in the 18th century. Why didn't they use them? Well, because of the way the grooves twisted down almost like a reverse corkscrew, you, when loading, it took several minutes to push the, the musket ball down through all those grooves. The accuracy range, they could hit something at 200 yards. And while you're in the process of taking two to three minutes to load the rifle, there's people with these that are getting off four shots a minute at you. So rifles tend to be used on a very limited basis. Actually, smooth wars were issued even at the beginning of the Civil War instead of rifles. Uh, muskets. It's a flintlock because the firing mechanism is a cock with a piece of flint, a steel frizzin. Flint hits the steel, makes sparks. The sparks drop down into the pan, ignites the small charge of powder in the pan. There's a small hole vent that goes into the barrel, which the ignition goes through there and lights the main charge and forces the projectile out. These are very inaccurate and also very undependable. About one time in four, you'll get a misfire. You won't get enough spark to ignite. Sometimes, if your vent is clogged up on a hot, muggy day, that can happen pretty easily because black powder turns to almost soupy very quickly if it gets damp. You can get an ignition of the powder in the pan, but not in the barrel, which is a flash in the pan which is something we use in... And then it's muzzle loading because the charge has to go down the muzzle end of the musket. You can't breech load until later. There are a limited number of breech loaders, but they're not very widespread and they're very expensive at that time. They're also not terribly def dependable. You get breech explosions in the early... And it took a while to get the technology down. Most fighting, you don't use your musket for shooting. You use it to touch your bayonet to, and in close, you're jabbing people. With this very effective three, it's a, almost a triangular blade, which makes a real nasty wound. Matter of fact, these are against the Geneva Convention now, because they're too cruel, too effective. These were uh, outlawed after World War I by international agreement. Normally, they would fire with the man in the It goes right, socket man, it goes right around the muzzle. We don't fire with bayonets on just as an added safety precaution, just in case it were to come loose during the firing process. This is a cartridge. This is what is used to load the musket with. We fire blank rounds. We don't fire musket balls. But a musket ball would be in the bottom here. You put your musket into the half cock position. That's kind of the safety position. Use your teeth. One of the regulations, you have to have two teeth. Because if you don't use your teeth to do this, you've got to set down the musket use both hands to rip open your cartridge. Black powder tastes really good, too. You put some in the pan, you close the frizzin, you cast the musket about, pour the remainder of the black powder down, and then you put the cartridge, which would originally have the ball in it as well. Now you've got the cartridge and the ball sitting here somewhere. 
you need to get it down to the bottom. So you take out your ramrod. Ram it down. Turn the ramrod. <coughs> you may notice part of the cartridge stuck to the ramrod. <coughs> because it's damp. So we may not get it into the fire. Now you're ready to fire. You have to take it from the half cock to the full cock position. This is a hammer stall. This is a 20th century safety device. They did not have these. This keeps it from auto accidentally going off before you're ready. Then you pull the trigger and we hope something happens. Hey! Yeah. That's my first demonstration of the year, too, and it worked. <laughs> When did they start using cartridges and stop using separate wires? Um, throughout the Seven Years' War and the Revolution, we, oh, you mean yeah. pre-made, that comes, um, it begins to get introduced at the time of the Mexican-American War, but there's still, Civil War soldiers are still, there are still units using this type of uh, musket or still using the paper cartridges. Um, there are percussion caps by then, though. They're not no longer flintlock. They have the percussion cap, where in addition to doing everything else we just did, they had to put a little cap over a little, what's called a nipple, mm -hmm. and that causes it to blow up. So you're not dealing with loose black powder here. Mm -hmm. The only loose black powder is what you're pouring down the muzzle. And you fire this about three times a day. If you don't clean it tomorrow, we pay for it, mm -hmm. because it it really clogs up and gets dirty very quickly. The dirtier it gets, the less likely it is to fire. So at the end of the day today, we'll be pouring hot water down the muzzle. It squirts out this little vent down here, and then we scrub. And this, well, you can just see how black my fingers are. And I've hardly touched the powder at all. So it gets very dirty very quickly. Any questions? Big nose to the boat. Top wall, the top level. Later, the general quarters. My fort's crumbling away.
reason these points are out here. This fort like this drives over 180 degrees fields of fire. I felt the rain drip. This is the ferry right outside of Ticonderoga, getting ready to go into Vermont and leave New York. You want a new videotape and driving up on the ferry? the ferry. There you can see where we left from. Headed over towards Vermont. Across Lake Champlain.
Lake Champlain. And we're right here on the ferry. Vermont right there. That must be the old ferry house. <coughs> Goodbye to the Adirondacks. 